Hey there, once again, YouTube. It looks like the old faithful webcam is down for the count right now. It has happened multiple times before. They will likely get it back up soon, hopefully. So, it's been very over once again, guys. First off, this video is likely going to be way too long for you, so please utilize the parts section in the description box below. Now, if you haven't already, please bookmark my website. A link is provided in the description box below. It contains a huge amount of information, including how to find, access, and analyze seismic and GPS deformation data, how to understand the many different types of seismic plots and charts people use, and it also contains hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots and images regarding a great many different earthquake swarms and events. In this video, I will be showing some information and data pertaining to two widely talked about topics as of late. The recent earthquake swarm that struck under Friday Harbor in Washington State, and the new thermal area that has been growing for the past decade or two just to the northeast, the north northeast, of Yellowstone Lake at Yellowstone Caldera. Please let me know if there are any mistakes and don't forget to check out my most recent videos. Uh, also, there was a magnitude 2.1 other event under the Olympic Peninsula uh, last night, so if you want to see that, go look at my most recent video, the video just right before this one. Now, if you wish to see the recent steamboat eruption, which was the largest steamboat eruption of 2019 and the largest since the 29th eruption of 2018, then please go to my website under the Seismic Events drop-down menu and click Steamboat 2019. Now, let's first start with the earthquake swarm under Friday Harbor in Washington State. Now, first off, Friday Harbor resides in the northwestern portion of Washington State. Now, starting on April 5th, just a few days ago or so, a strange but moderate swarm broke out in the confined area between Orcas Island and San Juan Island, right under the San Juan Channel, as you can see right here. Now, I have the U.S. fault setting on, and according to USGS, there are no definitive faults in this area at all. However, that doesn't mean that they don't exist or eventually could form. Now, the swarm consisted of 25 reported earthquake events, with magnitudes ranging from 0.2 to 2.9. Three of the earthquakes were reportedly felt by locals at magnitude 1.8, magnitude 2.5, and the magnitude 2.9. This swarm sparked the interest of many people, and I wouldn't be surprised if PNSN put out a blog post about this swarm. Well, they haven't done a post about this swarm yet, but remember the recent ETS episodic tremor and slip episode that has been occurring the past few months? Even the professionals admit that it is quite strange. And real quick, let's go through the magnitudes. Now, the depths of these events, now this is where the swarm mainly occurred. It's a strange location where I've never seen a swarm occur before. And we see a 1.9 at 20.3 kilometers in depth, a 1.6 at 15.9. Notice how many of them are between are between about 10 kilometers to 25 kilometers in depth. And the deepest, I believe, excuse me, was at, uh, at 20.3 kilometers in depth. I think that was the deepest. So it wasn't too deep of an earthquake swarm, but I'd expect swarms in this area to be a little bit more shallow. Very interesting, though, 1.4, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. A wide range of magnitudes, guys. Wide range. And these are just the earthquakes that were reported. I wouldn't be surprised if there were a few stragglers that were not reported. But the largest ones were reported, I believe. Now, here we are on PNSN.org on their most recent blog post called When... I, you know, I think they did a mistake. I think they made a mistake because it says, When is an ETS just T? Uh, maybe, or did they mean when an ETS is just T? Because T stands for tremor. And here's the map right here. Now, in my opinion, it is not a coincidence that this strange tremor event spotted in Washington State, basically stopped just prior to the earthquake swarm under the San Juan Channel near Friday Harbor. This is the location of the swarm epicenter right here. And this is the location of the episodic tremor and slip. Well, they say there wasn't that much slip occurring, but there was a, a lot of tremor. That's why they thought this was strange. Didn't make any sense. There was not that much slip occurring, but there was substantial tremor like there was slip occurring. So there's tremor without slip. That's interesting. Maybe that means something's upwelling from the ground? I don't know. From deep below? Who knows? But again, Friday Harbor, San Juan Islands, the swarm epicenter is right here. Notice how it stops right there. I thought that's very, very interesting. You know, and again, I also believe it's not a coincidence that the tremor events never went 
far enough north to reach Friday Harbor. Again, they stop just south, right here. Notice that? Although this is not a real ETS event, on which I agree with the professionals, there was indeed substantial tremor occurring, but not in any fashion really ever seen before. So could this tremor event have caused the earthquake swarm near Friday Harbor? I think it is possible. Or did both not really cause each other, but maybe both were being caused by the same process? Maybe. I think it's possible. Maybe a large earthquake's brewing? Because this activity, the strange tremor event, along with the strange earthquake swarm in Friday Harbor, is not necessarily normal. I don't know, guys. In my opinion, it's really not normal. Very strange activity. Just keep your heads on a swivel and always be prepared, no matter what. Now, I'm not going to read this blog post for the sake of time, but I will leave a link to it in the description box below. And I do highly suggest that you read this blog post if you're interested. It contains some amazing data. So, uh, very interesting, guys. Very in-depth. They did a very good job on this blog post, I have to say. I really, really like what they did. So again, this ETS event was basically just a T event. There was a bunch of tremor occurring, but no slip. How is that possible? It's not. Really, it's not, guys. But obviously, slip had to have been occurring in order for these tremors to be occurring. Unless, now get this, unless they're being caused by something else instead of slip. I don't know what the heck it could be, but it could be being caused by something else. I don't know. And the earthquake swarm near Friday Harbor could be connected to this weird tremor event. So we'll keep an eye on it. Again, I'll leave a link to this in the description box below. I highly suggest you read it. Very good. So why don't we go look at some seismic and GPS data for this swarm, shall we? So first, let's take a look at the recent GPS data for the closest GPS station to this earthquake swarm. Now, notice we have Washington State right here. Friday Harbor is right in this area right here. Let's zoom in. This is the swarm location. The epicenter of the swarm was right here. Now, this station right here might be able to show us something, but it might not. As we see here, the closest GPS station to the swarm is station SC02, and it is pretty close, so we should get a good look if anything transpired during this time period. And here we are at the GPS data download page at unavco.org. Now I'm going to use data from November 1st, 2018 through April 8th, 2019. So it was SC02, SC02, let's go down. CWU and AM08, that's all set. 2018, November 1st, 0 UTC. And then let's do, let's just do to April 10th, shall we? Because that's the date I'm making this video right now. April 10th at 1 UTC, just to get the most recent GPS data. Always click try it out. Let's see, we did get it. Now highlight this, open link in new tab, and it should open the download tab, press OK, and it downloaded. Okay, so guys, remember to always use the Delta section, never the STD Dev section. I know in my GPS video, and I did, uh, in two videos ago, I believe, I did say that I made a mistake, try to tell people. I even got the disclaimer on my website saying, hey, I made a mistake. Do not use STD Dev, use Delta. Okay, so we have SC02, which is basically right at the swarm epicenter at Friday Harbor. So let's first look at uplift or subsidence. Delta U will show up vertical uplift or subsidence and let's check out if any now there when it, wherever you are you should never see nothing at all you should always either see some type of uplift or some type of subsidence no matter how big how small you should always see some type of it should never be completely straight now that's very weird I, that that spike only lasted one day that does not look real let's see let let's zoom in Let's zoom in right here. Uh-oh, I got to change this. There we go. So this is the vertical data for SC02. Notice how this spike right here doesn't really make any sense. This was far, a long, 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 long time ago. Remember, the swarm happened around the 5th through the 7th, April 5th through April 7th. So that would be right at the end, right here. Let's see here, 163, 163, so yeah, it'd be right about this area. Let me add a trend line, shall we? Again, this is uplift or subsidence. Trend line is showing overall subsidence is occurring. Now, each horizontal section from right here to right here, remember, these are in meters, guys. So one, two, three to find the millimeters, that's 20 millimeters. This is 40 millimeters. 
Because of this big spike, the scale changed. So we see 20 millimeters, 20 millimeters per, uh, per excuse me, horizontal section. We are seeing a good amount of subsidence in this area, but there was a slight jump right when the swarm occurred that might not be related to the swarm, but it also could be. I don't know for sure because I'm not a geodist or geodesist or whatever they say, however they say it. <laughs> so let's go look at the horizontal components, shall we? Okay, so let's look at the east-west horizontal deformation, and delta E will show us any deformation for any ground movement heading towards the east, which would be up, or heading towards the west, which would be down, because the main component is east, which means up would be east when you see it heading up on the chart. Let me show you. Go right here, go right here. The uh, Very interesting. Very uh, This spike is very odd. I think that spike, I don't know why it's there on the horizontal component as well. That's very interesting. I'm going to do a little research into why that is, but it only happened within like a day, a day or two, and then just went right back to normal. So I thought that, that's very strange, very strange. So let's add a trend line, shall we? Notice how, let's see, from right here to right here again is, let's see, six, seven, eight, yeah, that's 20 millimeters. Each horizontal section is 20 millimeters. So we see a good, a good, uh, it's heading east, basically, guys. Notice that the trend line is heading upwards just a bit. But because the scale has been changed, that's probably a few millimeters per month or so, I'm going to say. A few millimeters per month towards the east. All right. Now let's check the north-south horizontal deformation, which will show us any deformation of the ground moving to, towards the north or towards the south. Let's go down, go down, go down, go down. All right, press insert, add the chart, 2D line graph. All right, here we go. Let me spread it out a little bit. All right, now it's at a trend line. Again, this is north-south horizontal deformation. We do see heading north overall, overall, guys. Not the whole time. We do see a little up and down here and there, but... Overall, and again, each horizontal section for this chart, let's see, one, two, three, one, two, three, that's five millimeters. So the change in the direction, uh, the change in direction is very small, guys, very, very small, but it still is occurring. It's heading northeast, which I find is very interesting, which I believe is the direction it should be heading. Because, you know, the Cascadia subduction zone from the Pacific plate going under the North American plate pushes it towards the east, right? Right? So it is heading northeast. So we don't see really much, but again, we do see right here on all three components a, a strange change in direction right when the earthquake swarm started. But the swarm wasn't major and the change wasn't major at all. So I don't know what was going on during this earthquake swarm, guys. Doesn't make any sense to me at all. Uh, I don't know. I'm just going to shrug. Again, we didn't see any major changes in GPS deformation. Now, since the swarm occurred rather recently, it does seem it is possible the station did move slightly to the south, maybe? I don't know exactly for sure during the swarm, and there maybe was a little bit of a jump in uplift, but that could be just part of the normal background activity. That might have nothing to do with the swarm, could be a coincidence, but we'll just have to wait and see where this heads. And, you know, I really hope PNSN puts out a post about this soon. I really do because I'm really scratching my head about this Friday Harbor Earthquake Swarm. Now, let's take a quick look at the seismic data for this swarm. Now, the closest seismic station to Friday Harbor, to this swarm, was, or is, supposedly, this one right here, basically right at the swarm epicenter, UWFH in the UW network. Now, this station, again, is very close to the GPS station I just showed and is just barely south of the earthquake swarm epicenter, which broke out in this location actually right there, just right there. So we should get a good look at the earthquakes that took place. But first, here is seismicity for Washington State only from March 11th, 2019 to right now, 1.16 p.m. Pacific time, April 10th, 2019. Now, Washington State does not see too many large earthquakes, but it does see some small earthquakes from time to time. However, it seems the past month or a little bit longer, the magnitudes have been rising. Now, usually magnitudes stay below 1.5 or so. 
Not saying that this is going to lead to anything or that this hasn't happened before. However, it is best to monitor Washington State closely over the next few months, just in case. Okay, so let's look at the seismic data for the swarm that broke out near Friday Harbor. Again, this right here, this magnitude 2.1 other event in the Olympic Peninsula I talked about in my most recent video. And see, they have an explosion in Forks, Washington. They do have a quarry up there, but this one was not marked as an explosion. It was definitely an other event because it, it was kind of weird looking. But again, there's the swarm up in Friday Harbor. Looks like we did have one just recently, 1.7 to 12.8 kilometers in depth. But let's go take a look at the seismic data for the main swarm. Now here we have the first data stream from UWFH, which is the closest seismic station to the earthquake swarm that occurred in Friday Harbor. This is the first data stream I'm going to use because I want to try to show every earthquake, or at least every reported earthquake, for this earthquake swarm to persist and rescale off overlap to 95. Do not need a filter since it's short period. Now, here's an earthquake right... Oh! Hey, okay, Um, that's very interesting. Do you want to notice something? Notice how these earthquakes, let's see if these are the same too. They are. Oh, okay. So, can you guys please go look at my most recent video? I mean the video just right, right before this one, guys. And I even might do a blog post on it soon. But the magnitude 2.1 other event underneath the Olympic Peninsula. I talked about in my most recent video. Go check that out. They look exactly like this. Exactly like this. So if the characteristics are almost exactly the same, let's see the frequencies. Yeah, characteristics are almost, yeah, almost exactly identical. Almost. Um, so why did they label these as earthquakes, but label the one under the Olympic Peninsula as an other event? I think that's very odd because these earthquakes here in Friday Harbor make no sense. They are very strange, very high frequencies, and very quick, too. Look at this. This is three seconds right here. That's it. Three seconds. Very strange, guys. And then, of course, we have other background activity. Surface noise, surface activity. Trust me, this is surface. some of this. I'm not saying all of it is, guys, but most of it is. Because this is, yeah, that's definitely not all real activity especially if you cross-correlate it with some of the other stations. But look at this, guys. Here's another event. It looks exactly the same as the magnitude 2.1 other event under the Olympic Peninsula that, again, I talked about in my most recent video prior to this one. Dominant high-range frequencies, strong, strong high frequencies going well beyond 25 hertz. And then we see another earthquake, and another one, and another one, and keep going forward, and another one, and another one. Remember, some of these were reportedly felt, but look at how strange they look. Do you notice that? Look at how strange these are. And they occur very fast and occur and have extremely high frequencies, guys. Very high frequencies. I have to say these are odd. These are unlike any earthquake I really have ever seen before. The really the only other seismic event that I could say looks similar is, of course, the magnitude 2.1 other event underneath the Olympic Peninsula, which I just talked about, and the chemical explosions in California that they sometimes do near the Oroville Dam. And I thought that's very interesting, and the chemical explosion signature seems very similar, very similar to these right here. Notice that? And I believe I do have a chemical explosion uh, under the Seismic Events drop-down menu on my website, under the exotic events page, I believe I do have one on there, and it looks very similar to these. Keep going forward, keep going forward, keep going forward, keep going forward. Let's see, I not see much up there. Okay, then we see an interesting burst. Let's see, that's nothing, that's nothing, that's nothing. A few quakes here and there, and then boom! Looky, looky here. Look at this, guys, man. And again, these earthquakes do not last long at all. For 2.9, I would expect these to last much longer. I believe right here is the magnitude 2.9, I believe. And multiple subsequent aftershocks again. And then we have tinier, tiny, tiny, tiny guys throughout the rest of the day. Now let's open the next data set. We already looked at most of the earthquakes in this day. Let's open the next data set and see if the types of earthquakes have changed, if their characteristics have changed at all. So let's now remember the majority of the seismicity was on the 5th. Now here we are from the 6th through the 7th. 
Now, let me, I already did that. Let me turn spectrogram on. Here we see another earthquake right here. Very tiny though, very tiny right here. Let's zoom in. Yeah, characteristics are very strange. Very, very odd. Let's keep going forward, not seeing any other earthquakes. And then we did have another burst in seismicity right down here. With some strange lower frequencies, uh, this might not be an earthquake, but it does look similar to the other earthquakes they have reported. I don't know what that is. I don't know. Guys, I really do not understand what's going on at Friday Harbor. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever at all. It's just very strange. Very strange. We should not have seen an earthquake swarm up there, let alone an earthquake swarm with these type of characteristics that don't even look natural. In my opinion, they do not look natural, but they were real earthquakes and they are natural. Let's see. Any more earthquakes during this day? No. There really was only one or two earthquakes from the 6th through the 7th. Remember, the majority of the seismicity occurred on April 5th. So let's go back. Let's close out. Let's open the next data stream, the last one that I want to show, which there were a few earthquakes that occurred from the 7th through the 8th. Let's see. Let's go back. Let's turn persistent rescale off. Set overlap to 95. Again, we do not need a Butterworth filter right now. Let's see. Again, we do have some earthquakes that look a little bit normal. Let's check. Nope, never mind. They still look like those weird other event chemical explosion-y thingy-mabobs. <laughs> I mean, they're weird, guys. These are these are some weird events. Let's go to the waveforms. Again, not lasting very long at all from here to here. It's only three seconds, guys. Three seconds. That's it. And let's see. Do not know if that was another burst in seismicity. Probably not. Let's see. There were... Oh, hello. We had what looks like an actual earthquake. This looks like a real earthquake. Now this is what I'm talking about, guys. This is this is a real earthquake, in my opinion. This is what it should look like, guys. That's just my opinion. Here, now this on the web recorder, this looks like an earthquake, doesn't it? And so does this. That's not an earthquake. That's not an earthquake, that's for sure. See, that's why you cannot, and I repeat, you can not only use web recorders these blue charts for your analysis or for your conclusions. I am telling you right now, never come up with a conclusion at all, ever, unless you look at the actual seismic data. Seriously, because the online helicorder charts are just images with pixels. But here, I have an actual helicorder, but it's not pixelated, is it? These are not actual pixels. These are actually pieces of data that you can read right here in the program Swarm. Swarm can read many different file types, mini seed, SAC files. So again, if anyone tells you, oh yeah, you can just monitor Yellowstone or other areas with just the web recorders, don't worry, no. <laughs> Sorry guys, but basically, no, you cannot. Otherwise, you will be deceived by somebody else. You will be. Always look at the waveform and frequency data. That is the number one thing seismologists use. Seismologists rarely ever use the web recorders. I mean, the web recorders are useful, and really, we would be nowhere without them. We need the web recorders, guys. We need them. We need those helicorders. But the thing is, is you can, they're not meant to be used by themselves at all. Otherwise, you will get very confused. Okay, so really, the seismicity at Friday Harbor has calmed down as of late. Still don't know why the swarm occurred at all, but we would keep an eye on it and see if it occurs again. Now, now that's all said and done, let's move on to Yellowstone. A new thermal area was recently discovered to the north northeast of Yellowstone Lake. Well, it wasn't discovered too recently, but information on this is just now coming to light. I believe it was discovered in April 2017, I believe. All right, here we are at the Yellowstone Caldera Chronicles. Now, if you have already seen this article and read the whole thing, and you don't want to hear the information again, you can use the parts section to skip forward or just move on to something else. But because I have not reported on it or really read it much myself, actually I have read it myself, but uh, not too, too in depth. I just skimmed over it. Um, just simply just move on if you've seen this, guys. Just move on because I'm going to read it no matter what. Discovering new thermal areas in Yellowstone's landscape is, di oh, in Yellowstone's dynamic landscape. <laughs> excuse me. Yellowstone's thermal areas are the surface expression, excuse me, of the deeper magmatic system, and they are always changing. They heat up, they cool down, they can move around. 
A recent spectacular example was the September 2018 emergence of a new thermal feature and eruption of the Long Dormant Ear Spring in the Upper Geyser Basin near Old Faithful. Remember that, guys? I remember there were a few people back then uh, in September 2018 saying, Guys, this means an eruption's coming! This means an eruption's coming! And, you know, eventually, someday, those people are going to be right. Yeah, they are going to be right someday. An eruption is coming. We just don't know when. Guys, Yellowstone will erupt again. It could erupt tomorrow. It could erupt next month. It could erupt next year. But there should be signs. There should be signs before that occurs. There should be at least a few weeks of ground uplift, guys. We should see at least a few weeks, at the very, very least, of ground uplift before an eruption occurs. But yeah, people were saying, it's going to erupt in a week, guys. Never happened. Some people were saying after the, what was it, the 15th or 20th eruption of Steamboat Geyser that Yellowstone was going to erupt. Never erupted. Subsidence continues. But that doesn't mean something bad won't happen down the road. I mean, you get, you can't listen to both sides 100%, guys. That's why I think having these data sets and making your own interpretations, coming to your own conclusions, is the best idea by far. Because that way, you won't get deceived by anyone, will you? So again, to the September 2018 emergence of a new thermal feature and eruption of the long dormant ear spring of the Upper Geyser Basin near Old Faithful. Even more impressive was the expansion of heated ground in the back basin of the Norris Geyser Basin in 2003. Now these sorts of changes are part of the normal life cycles of thermal areas in Yellowstone National Park. Yes, that is true. They are part of the normal life cycles. However, guys, they are increasing. I mean, if, even if you look at the uh, uplift over the past few decades, Although the ground is breathing, going up and down, up and down, and I do believe uplift will start again in two years. That's my personal opinion. Every time it breathes up and down, up and down, the ground gets higher and higher. It never goes back to normal, guys. And so it is increasing for an eruption. We know that. We know there's magma coming into the system. That's why the uplift is occurring. We know that it is possible, an eruption. I mean, the professionals try to say there's no chance, no chance whatsoever that an eruption would occur in our lifetimes. And some YouTubers say, oh, it's definitely going to erupt in the next year. Both sides could be wrong, guys. I, I don't like to listen to either side, really. I just like to look at the data. And in my opinion, Yellowstone is charging for a super eruption or some type of lava eruption or something, guys. It is charging for one. But right now, seismicity is low, deformation is low. So there's no sign of that right now. But that is why we must monitor these areas very closely. Now, first for a little background, a thermal area is a contiguous geological unit that includes one or more thermal features, fumaroles, hot springs, or geysers, surrounded by hydrothermally altered ground, hydrothermal mineral deposits, geothermal gas emissions, heated ground, and or lack of vegetation. There are more than 10,000 thermal features in Yellowstone, most of which are clustered together into about 120 distinct thermal areas, like Upper Geyser Basin, Norris Geyser Basin, one such area is called the Turn Lake Thermal Area and is located in the central part of the park along the northeast margin of the Sour Creek Resurgent Dome. Notice right here we have the Sour Creek Resurgent Dome, the Mallard Lake Resurgent Dome. We do have the caldera boundary marked in black. The red areas are thermal areas and right here, this square, this little red dot in the middle of the square is the brand new baby thermal area. We need to have a baby shower for this thermal area, guys. <laughs> Notice how it is just north, northeast of Yellowstone Lake. We have had recent swarming up in this area and also swarming down in this area as well. But seismicity for this area, as you will see in a second, is not too major, which I found, thought was very intriguing. I don't know why it wouldn't be major at all. Oh, it's not letting me click out. There we go. Now, it is named after nearby Turn Lake and West Turn Lake. This area is deep in Yellowstone's backcountry, about half a mile from the nearest trail and about 11.2 miles from the nearest trail head. Therefore, very few people have visited this site. Now, guys, when you see anything go offline, now, if everything went offline at Yellowstone, yeah, I'd be concerned. But if you once in a while, only one station goes down, that's not too major. But when you see a station go down, you think they could go out there and fix it right away, right, guys? Not necessarily. Number one, during winter, it's even worse. But when it's not winter, everything is very remote at Yellowstone. It's not populated, guys. There's not that many roads. I mean, there's I mean, there's a crazy amount of roads, crazy amount of trails. But there are still very remote areas at Yellowstone that takes many, 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 many hours. And you got to camp out, set up a camp, 
to do anything, really. So, you know, it'd be cool to work at Yellowstone. I think I would love to visit Yellowstone. If I do visit Yellowstone the next year, I'm definitely going to visit the new thermal area. Except I'm not going to stand in it, though. Don't, don't worry, I'm not going to actually stand in it. Now, again, let's see where I leave off. Indeed, many of Yellowstone's thermal areas are located in remote and inaccessible areas of the park. This is why YVO scientists use satellite-based thermal infrared remote sensing to help map the locations of thermal areas and their changes through time. Landsat 8 thermal infrared images are a great resource for examining thermal areas, especially when the temperature-sensitive images are acquired at night when the contrast between thermal areas and unheated ground is highest. Analysis of a Landsat 8 nighttime thermal infrared image acquired in April 2017 revealed an unexpected warm area between West Turn Lake and the previously mapped Turn Lake thermal area. This mysterious patch of bright pixels in the thermal, red, uh, thermal infrared image did not match any previously mapped thermal areas. Could it be a lake? At night, lakes are warmer than the surrounding land and stand out in thermal infrared images, but only if they are liquid, not frozen. All of Yellowstone's lakes without significant thermal inputs stay frozen throughout the winter, but the lakes can start to thaw in April. In fact, this appears to be a case in April 2017. Some of the lakes are clearly frozen. But West Turn Lake appeared to be starting to thaw. Now, this may have been because the lake was receiving thermal water from nearby hot springs, but that new bright area between West Turn Lake and the previously mapped Turn Lake thermal area is not a lake. So, what was it? High-resolution airborne visible images held the answer, and this was the big one. Now, the NEIP, administered by USDA's Farm Service Agency, acquires high-resolution 0.5 to 1 megapixel. Is that, does that mean megapixel? 1-M pixel? I... I think that means megapixel, I'm not sure. Aerial, aerial imagery over the continental U.S. every few years. Now, the most recent image of the Turn Lake region from 2017 reveals a large area of dead trees and bright soil, rather like a thermal area. The NAIP imagery from 2006 shows a smaller zone barren of vegetation in the beginnings of a tree kill zone with many reddish brown trees among healthy green ones. The 1994 air photos, while black and white and lower spatial resolution, clearly show that this area was once an area of healthy trees with no hint of any thermal area. Other historical imagery that have been analyzed indicate that this thermal area started to form in the late 90s or early 2000s. It is also notable that between 2006 and 2017, there was an increase in the size of the tree kill zone on the north side of the actual thermal area. You notice that? All right, let's look right here. So notice this is the thermal area in 1994. There, this is the new thermal area, and there's nothing to see here at all, right? Look up here. This is starting to spread to the north just a tiny bit, and these are starting to brown. As of 2017, the thermal area up here has spread far to the north, and all the trees are dead in this patch right here. Now, it says there's a newly emerging area of warm ground and tree kills, about 32,500 meters squared, eight acres, or about four soccer fields, guys. Four soccer fields. Woo! The air photo from 2006 shows the beginnings of a tree kill zone. Wow. Now, from all these satellites and aerial images, we conclude that a new thermal area has emerged in the past 20 years. The newly emerging thermal area, located at 44.6635 degrees north latitude, 110.279 degrees west longitude can be seen using Google Earth, and in fact, using the Time Slider tool in Google Earth, one can now see that this area has changed since 1994. You can see the changes in vegetation yourself, and we will do that in just a second. The recognition of the new thermal area is a great example of the importance of satellite thermal infrared imaging, which I wish we had access to, guys. I do not think we have access to that. I think only the government has access to thermal infrared imaging. Why don't we have access to it? It'd be a simple push of a button to let the public see it. <laughs> really, though. I mean, it, maybe it is available to us. I just don't know where it is. I've looked for it. I can't find any thermal infrared imaging data. I mean, they don't, you can only see it if they decide to put it out. Now, this is exactly the sort of behavior we expect from Yellowstone's dynamic hydrothermal activity, and it highlights the changes that, we, that are always taking place, sometimes in remote and generally inaccessible areas of the park. We will continue to keep an eye on Yellowstone using satellite imagery, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it's not just hydrothermal activity, guys. There might be a little bit of degassing in there as well. But this is extremely intriguing. The location of this new thermal area is just to the north-northeast of Yellowstone Lake. Now, although they state hydrothermal activity is causing this, 
I really do hope they conduct some gas sampling of this area because this could be caused by both hydrothermal activity and concentrated degassing. I don't know for sure if this is happening, the degassing part, but I really hope research is conducted into exactly how this new thermal feature is being formed. Now he said you could see the changes especially on Google Earth. So here we are at Google Earth. Let's zoom into Yellowstone, shall we? And let's take a look at the new thermal area near West Turn Lake. In between Turn Lake Thermal Area and West Turn Lake. I don't know. I hope they name it something. Maybe they're just going to add it to the existing Turn Lake Thermal Area. And it's going to be right in this area, right here. Yep. You can already see the incursion with the naked eye. All right. This is it right here. Right here. This is the tree kill spot. Notice we have Turn Lake. Let's, oh, wow. Figures. Come on, buddy. Notice we have Turn Lake. This is West Turn Lake. It kind of looks like a pair of lungs, doesn't it? <laughs> but right here, we do have the new thermal area. There's the original thermal area. Now, I want you, I'm going to do past satellite imagery. If you're in Google Earth, you could do it this way. Press the arrow, the backwards arrow with the clock. All right, now we're going to go backwards. One, now this is from, let's see, 2000 and... Do, 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 do. 2015. Okay, so they don't have the most recent image from 2017, but we do see that about 2015 is when the trees actually died. Now let's go back. And this one was taken in August of 2009, I believe. Now let me go forward just one more time to the most recent image they have on here. You could tell. Now let's go back. Let's go forward. Let's go back. Let's go forward. Let's go back. Let's go forward. You can tell it really killed off a lot of trees. Oh, yeah. And it does look like this thermal area up here is spreading out as well. Notice, see, there's there's no dead patch right here, right? Look right in this area. And then I'm going to go forward. Boom, there's a dead patch. So this is spreading out as well. I wonder if this whole entire area is eventually going to be one big thermal area. Maybe a new geyser basin. Who knows? Let's go back one more time. Here's another one from 2009 during the winter. Let's go back again. Here's 2006. We see eh, it's starting to increase here. It's starting to increase a little bit. It's starting to kill some trees off. Let's go back to another one from April 2006. Let's go back. 2005. Let's go back. Here's February 2005 right here, I believe. Let's go back. August 2003. Again, we see few dying off, but nothing too major right there. And then 1994, we see nothing at all, really, at all. So let's go forward, go forward, go forward, go forward, go forward, go forward. Wow, look at that. Wow. I'm going to do that again. Very intriguing. Look at that. Look at how it just grows, guys. Notice that? Very cool. I do hope they add some new images to here soon. So, we notice that this new thermal area is indeed growing. Now, they say it started somewhere around the year 2000 or so, and that is probably true. But I believe something else helped push this thermal area to grow even more. Okay, so here we have the Turn Lake and surrounding area. Turn Lake's right here, and West Turn Lake is right here. And we have a few other little lakes around the area. But this is the surrounding area. This is set to every single magnitude from January 1st, 2000 to April 9th, 2019. Over 19 years worth of seismicity for this area, and we see a total of 305 reported earthquakes. Now notice how there is a large patch of seismicity right here. Now this could have been caused by other processes or it could have been caused by the same process that is creating the new thermal area right here. Who knows? However, after zooming in actually to the thermal area, which we should do right here, we see far less seismicity. Notice that? Out of 305, there's only 46. This is odd. But notice how as we go through the list of earthquakes shown here, actually, let's pan over. I'm going to turn satellite on just so you can see where the thermal area is. There we go. So remember, here's the new thermal area right here, right? Here's the brand new thermal area. Only two quakes in the past 10 years or 20 years or more or so. 
Let's see, 2009? 2009, interesting. Notice how it's basically in January of 2009. That's very interesting. Now, why is that important? But let's go through. Notice 2009, 2009, January 2009, January 2009, January 2009, January 2009, 2009, 2009, 2009, 2009, a few in 2007, a few in 2003. But ma the majority for this area has been in 2009. Now, why is that important that the majority of the seismicity for the Turn Lake and West Turn Lake area that was only around the beginning of 2009 in January? Well, that is just after the dike intrusion of magma struck beneath Yellowstone Lake. Now, in my opinion, that was the most concerning earthquake swarm Yellowstone has ever seen with over 800 earthquakes in less than one week. The 2008-2009 dike intrusion of magma underneath Yellowstone Lake contained many different types of earthquakes, including an explosive earthquake, VT quakes, hybrid quakes, and even strange low-frequency events. Now, if you wish to see some information pertaining, uh, information and seismic plots pertaining to that earthquake swarm, please, then please come to my website here, go to the Seismic Events drop-down menu, and click 2008-2009 Yellowstone Lake. Many plots and pages on my website will be updated as time goes on, so more content may be coming to this page in the coming months, but it already contains a good amount of information and plots about the VT quakes and hybrid quakes that we saw, and also some of the lower frequency events too. Now, of course, I could be wrong, but again, could it be possible that the dike intrusion of magma that occurred a decade ago underneath Yellowstone Lake enhanced and sped up the process of this thermal area being created? I think so. Let me know what you think below. So that was pretty interesting, guys. It looks like they still haven't updated their webcam at all. It's still offline for some weird reason. So what do you think about the swarm near Friday Harbor in Washington State? Again, it was not too major, but I do believe I've never seen a swarm occur in this location before. Also, the new thermal area just north-northeast of Yellowstone Lake right next to Turn Lake is pretty intriguing. Let's hope no hikers decide to camp there, because sometimes gases from volcanoes and even Yellowstone in the past can kill animals, trees, and sometimes even humans. So if you are visiting Yellowstone, please remember it is beautiful, yes. But in this life, the most beautiful things in nature can sometimes be the most deadly. Remember, it still is a volcano, and standing on top of a volcano is dangerous no matter what. That being said, I would love to visit Yellowstone someday soon. There are so many spots I want to check out, especially epicenters of previous shallow rapid-fire swarms. I only have ever seen a geyser erupt through a webcam, so it'd be pretty cool to check one out in person. So if you're going to go to Yellowstone for summer, like many other people, have fun, but please use extreme caution, especially if you go check out the new thermal feature near Turn Lake. Now I'll be back soon, guys, and thank you all for all your support. I hope you all have a great night, and God bless. Remember, the truth is considered hater fear to those who hate or fear the truth.